here. Come stand on the hot coals with me. <laughs> this is uh, Brian Petrucci, and Brian and I met in about 1995 <coughs> or six. I think. Okay. He was doing some consulting work for a farm that, that was trying to get itself back into production. He's a grazing expert, and he was a grazing expert back when he was the only grazing expert in the United States. And when we met, I was a cheesemaker, not a farmer, and uh, we started discussing, uh, you know, he was trying to get this farm back into production. He wanted them to be a mostly or all grass-based dairy operation, and he was, t most cheesemakers he had met, as soon as he mentioned grass-fed and seasonal, they go, oh, I can't do that, it's got to be the same milk every single day. And so he sort of beat around the bush, describing how he was going to farm. And then at some point I said, so this is going to be like seasonal milk. He goes, yeah, is that all right? I said, yeah, that's fine. And instant friendship. <laughs> because we were like, you know, two lone voices in the wilderness, finally hearing each other, you know, speak in the same language. Um, so with his help, I, tr I transitioned from being a, a, a cheesemaker who bought milk from conventional farms, because that's all there was in 1993. Um, to a farmer, um, and I think we were, I don't know if we were the first 100% grass-fed cheesemakers in the United States. We we're probably one of the first. Yeah. You might know. I, I don't, I'm not aware of anybody that started before us, but if there might have been two or three before us, now there's what, a couple hundred maybe? Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's in, since 2002. So, you know, don't, don't let people tell you that you can't change the world, because we either that or the world just was changing and we happen to be in the right I mean, I, when it comes to pasture plants, I divide them into two, roughly two categories, things that cows eat and things that cows don't eat. Uh, Brian can probably put some names to them more than I can. Um, but I think the important thing that we want to show people in this tour is, um, and I think this is something that Bobolink really exemplifies, um, this is a place where uh, nature, uh, in, in, indigenous species of animals and plants and agriculture um, are not only coexisting, but they're actually um, uh, uh, symbiotically, you know, intertwined and interrelated and inter and thriving because of each other. I mean, fundamentally, we just, you know, our agricultural practices have enabled us to preserve 184 and a half acres of land from development. So, you know, sort of fundamentally. That's one way in which agriculture can help. But the way we're farming um, is actually lever using Mother Nature as an ally rather than, than an adversary. Because I'll tell you, Mother Nature makes a really good ad ally. She's a terrible, you really don't want her as an adversary. Yet most agriculture is based on annihilation, on, on trying to annihilate and manipulate and control. And uh, I would say categorically in matters agricultural, medical, social and political, annihilation is a bad theory. It doesn't work, you never get them all, and the ones that survive come back stronger than ever and really angry, okay? <laughs> and that's true in Bosnia, and it's true in your bloodstream, and it's certainly true in, uh, in Lance. So, um, did you rub it with anything, or what did you uh, We did Jean-Louis Dry Cure on it, which is salt, sugar, and thyme uh, for two days, and then we soaked it in fresh running water for about an hour, uh, dried it, um, and then roasted it. And we've got, um, the chickens are uh, pasture raised by my friend John Lima, who I don't think is coming today. They were salted, um, they were peppered with uh, grains of paradise, um, and then I stuffed them with sprigs of thyme, fresh thyme, and um, sedana, which is the leafy celery, the Italian celery that's more leaf and flavor and not all rib and water. Uh, it's nice and aromatic. Oh. So, um, anyway, yeah, I'd say that pig is done. <laughs> Any vegans here? Yeah, modern cows, 98% of the dairy cows in the U.S. are um, Holsteins, actually in the world, are Holstein Frisians, the black and white Ben and Jerry's pattern cows. And they've been bred for one thing, standing at a feed trough, eating corn silage, and excreting huge quantities of milk. Um, when, you when you breed for one attribute, you breed against all other attributes. Um, what we needed was cows that knew how to be mothers, because I'm not raising their brats, uh, <laughs> that knew how to find grass, they knew how to not poison themselves by eating the wrong thing, um, 
They needed uh, good parasite resistance because a, a, an industrial cow who's only going to be alive for three or four years may never have a parasite problem. A cow who's going to live for much, much longer Where's could build up a load of parasites. There's the baby. Four days old. Yeah. yeah. Hysterically, some of our some of these carries had cataracts, and conventional dairy farmers who visited the farm would see the uh, sclera on the eye, and they go, "Oh, what was that? Was that like uh, pink eye or an infection?" And I'd say, "Well, actually, it's um, you know, it's a cataract." That's ridiculous. I've been farming for 50 years. I've never seen a cow with cataract. Oh yeah, how old was your oldest cow? Mm -hmm. You know, they, I mean, it's like when they're 10 or 12, and a lot of farmers have never seen a cow that old. Um, so anyway, so the carry brought everything that we were looking for. I didn't know about the carry until somebody offered it to me, but I just think it was one of those things where I think they found us, you know? I think the, the cows found us. Can so. you tell us why you were, you said you were selected to get the, this breed and there weren't many of them, so what was it, was there a criteria, the way you were farming them that you were offered these? Or? Why were they, they were given to us by a rare breed collector who had decided not to collect cows anymore. Uh, it's a big job. And she had called uh, her a friend of hers, um, who's a farming consultant who I've known for a long time. And um, so this mutual friend uh, suggested that she give them to us because you know she wanted them to go someplace where they'd be appreciated. And uh, she was shocked to find out. Then that this is six years ago, okay? She about a year ago. I, I still haven't met the woman, but um, uh, our mutual friend uh, ran into her and she said, "Oh, you know." I'd love to see some pictures of the grandchildren and great grandchildren. And Annie said, uh, "You could do some of them. Are, you can come see Liberty. She's still alive." <laughs> and she was pretty amazed. But yeah, they they uh, they seem to like it here. Uh, so this is mostly um, yearlings um, who are due to calve. There's a few bulls here to keep them bred, um, and uh, a couple of older cows who just didn't get pregnant this year. Which on a commercial dairy farm, you know, one strike you're out. Here, if they don't get pregnant, we we keep them around. Rachel has a calf every other year. That's fine. Uh, you know, we're not buying feed for them, so uh, we can be generous. Uh, there's a bunch of calves in here from earlier this year, the smaller ones. There's a whole bunch of yearlings. Um, there's a calf in the back there. And right now, there, you notice we walked over, they didn't, the bulls stood up, but the rest of them are just kind of doing what they were doing. They don't feel particularly threatened by us. If we were to go into the group, uh, that would probably get their attention and they might get a little nervous. Let me see. You want to come over, Rachel? Come here. You want to come say hi? Come come say hi. Whoops. Oh, this is Cersei right here. Cersei. Oh, it is. You want to go? I'm speaking of cataracts. Look at you see her right eye? Wow. That's what I need to have. Wow. That is a very fat old lady. <laughs> Here we go. I don't want to keep it open too long. So there's our potatoes and leeks and other stuff. Now, how many people here saw our old oven at the old farm? Okay. Pictures of it. This is <laughs> this is about this one is the old one was 42 by 48. This is 48 by 72, so this is a, almost a third again larger oven. Is it wood fired? Or? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're burning 275 pounds of wood every night, seven days a week. We only bake five days a week, but we just keep it hot. Wow. And, uh, Are you getting all this wood from your farm? Uh, no, actually I'm buying it from neighbors. I don't have time. <laughs> We're uh, supporting the local economy. I should close this so we don't uh, wow. delay lunch. So, That's an old Yeah, yeah. It's a tribute to my grandmother, the tailor. Sure. Oh, wow. Oh, Did you see this? He has a sewing machine. Where's Mickey? Where's Mickey? the door. This is why we became farmers. <laughs> Because you cannot do this with industrial milk. You just can't. The complexity, and I don't know, you know, you've probably been hearing this for two hours already. But, um, you know, even the best cheesemaker who re inoculates after pasteurizing maybe uses five or seven microbes. And this has 
not only the microbes we know about, but the unknown ones. And I think part of the secret is that we have all the good, the, the beauty in all its complexity from up the right hill up is, is in here. Who else? Who else? So this is the tower, the fallen tower of Babel. <laughs> Yeah. Fall and shower? Come on, come forward. <laughs>